Hi, Carl. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we're going live right now. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you all for attending and coming out uh, today to the birth of Boyd Street. And in just a few minutes, we hope start the film. So with nothing more, we will begin the viewing of the birth of Gordon Street. So thank you. Hello, my name is Daryl Wimberly, and I am the president of Connect 360. And through the Healing Illinois grant, uh, funding has been made available to present you this documentary, The Birth of Boynton Street Community Center. Uh, you're going to hear testimonies of people that went through some issues here in Marion, Illinois, uh, that as a result of some tragedies in their personal lives, that they chose to get involved and do things in a positive manner. Uh, I think in the climate we're in today, uh, where there's so much divide in our community, I think this is an excellent time for us to handle things in the proper manner, and I am so grateful that I have others that are willing to uh, participate and to uh, talk to you about some things that they actually have experienced. I know a lot of times people say, how can you say you know where I'm coming from if you haven't been where I've been? And so that's why I want to give you an opportunity, uh, everyone that views this program, to see what uh, African Americans have went through, as well as to listen to Stephanie Willis, who is the current director at Boynton Street Community Center. And she's been the only director that this uh, uh, community center has had. She's served faithfully, and so we look forward to hearing what she has to say. But at this time, I'd like to present to you uh, one of the founding members, as well as a board member of Connect360, Ms. Carmen Adele. Hello. Greetings. This program is about healing. But first, in order to heal, we must know our roots. We must know our path. We must know our struggles. And so, I wish to present you our path to today. Now I have three, uh, later on you will see three of the original Black Brothers of Progress and they will help us on that journey. But for right now, I just want to give you my truth, my truth, from the 50s till today, we will always kneel and pray for the change that hasn't come, for the steps already done, for the fight, for the rights, and the countless sleepless nights. We have crawled, we have walked, we have marched, and we have fought. We chant, it's a long time coming, but this race, we must keep running. Running this race, running this race, running this race, and stepping up the pace. To rid us of this racism that's practiced everywhere, <laughs> that's practiced everywhere, so common, they don't care. We say we are provoked. We say we are woke. But still, we get complacent with this pandemic and systemic racism. Are we fed up with the setup? <laughs> we 
We out here getting killed while they're sitting there being chilled. We calling, we screaming, we chanting. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. The more things change, the more they remain the same. And still, we have no answers. Well, my name is Donald Allen. I'm a pastor and minister and a father. But I want to share with you about this neighborhood here in Marion that I call, we call the black community or the gents community. And one of the things I want to identify with is growing up here in Marion as a young man. And I used to, I could just say that, but that's not really perfectly true, is it? Because I grew up as a young man, but people not my color taught me to grow up as a black young man. And being a, growing up as a black young man was a lot of pressure and a lot of rejection. And as a boy, as I grew up with it, and I listened to my dad and his brothers and the people in my neighborhood talk about the man holding us back, not giving us jobs. I can remember when my dad and his brothers and the men in the neighborhood would come down and meet down at the bottom of uh, Copeland and Monroe waiting on the man to come by and give us jobs. My dad and them, they'd get picked, some would, some wouldn't, but it was real hard. And I thought that was always amazing, yet they still had to pay their taxes. They still had to pay their water bill and light bill like everybody else. And my mind as a teenager, I used to say, how do you expect them to do that if you won't give them no job? And everybody back then was struggling to keep a job. The best way to do it was try to get on construction, and, and in wintertime, hopefully, if you got enough work, you can rock. But most of us in that neighborhood had to live on the dole, or what they call relief or public aid, because the jobs weren't available for us. And not so much because of a qualification, but because of a colorification. And we grew up learning that, and then we grow up as young teenagers, me and my brothers, and our friends in the neighborhood, we go up around the Marion City Square at different times on the weekend, in the evenings, and at night. And every time we go up around the square, here comes the police run us out from around the square. We just walk around the square. We had no business there, and we were told we need to get back in our neighborhood. And it makes it feel like in the black neighborhood was totally separate from Marion. But we would ask them questions, you know, as you get to be an older teenager, you say, hey man, I'm a citizen too. What do you mean I can't walk around the square? Well, if you don't want to get arrested, you better get on back in your neighborhood. So we grew up with that. We'd go into what they had, the Marion Orpheum Theater. And they, we, all the black folk, had only could only go in one place in the Orpheum Theater. We had to go upstairs and sit there if you wanted to be in the movie and watch it. We couldn't roam around. We just had to go up there and watch. And every now and then, some of my brothers and neighborhood fellows we grew up with, we'd go downstairs where everybody else was, and we'd get run back upstairs or get kicked out of the show house. And so it was very offensive. But you know, those things makes you feel angry, and you're trying to fight the anger. And you know, when we was in high school, it was a strange thing because we grew up in a black neighborhood where well, the grade school was all black, which is called Douglas School. And then a day came when all of a sudden we was being integrated where we went to school with the white kids. And I found that remarkable because when I started listening to the white kids read in class, you know, junior high level, and I would read, you thought I just started learning to read. They would read so fast until my head was dizzy. They, they knew the language, they could talk and just run their mouths and run that word off. And I would look at them and think, are you memorizing? Are you really reading this? And it made me realize how far back, how far back we had been set back, being in this black neighborhood and being segregated from the rest of the town and the community and that, that we lived in. And, and it was a very offensive place. And then we get mocked at 
But then we start hearing something when we got in the integrated school. In junior high, you know, when you're in junior high, kids just talk a lot and don't think anyway. But I started hearing a word that uh, shook me, and it was called nigger. And when I first heard it, it would tickle me, but I didn't pay it no mind. But then I got to where you heard a little more and more, and I remember we'd get out in the evening from the junior high and the parents would come and pick up some of the kids. Of course, we never had no way to pick us up. So all of us would have to walk on them. But you'd hear that, what are you doing over there with them? Nigger boys. Some of the white boys wanted just to we'd just be talking as kids. And I'd hear those statements and I thought, this is strange. This is strange. But I think the worst of it for me was when I got into high school. And we'd be in high school just going through our classes and changes and how they would segregate us, even going up and down the halls where we had to be in a particular area when we come together. And we, when it'd storm and rain, we'd, we'd go into the girls' gym, everybody, and you could dance and have music and do whatever you wanted in there. And so being black kids, we used to get in huddle and dancing and laughing and talking. But when we'd be out there on the floor dancing, here comes all these spray of pennies throwing and hitting us and the girls. I mean hard and a, a very offensive. And then, you know, it almost, it break out sometimes, maybe three or four times in a fight. Because we didn't know who done what. But it was constantly screaming that word, nigger, nigger. Nigger, nigger, go back to Africa. And that kind of thing when we grew up in high school. And you, you, when, you, when you grow up under that kind of oppression, it changes you. It changed your attitude and all of a sudden, I'm no longer Donald the teenager. I'm the black boy, Donald the teenager. That's why I had to look at me. But when I look over at my white counterpart, I wasn't the black boy, Donald the teenager. I was the nigger, Donald the teenager. And so I grew up with all in, in that kind of racism. And so we started working together and then Something very tragic happened. Right now at this point, I, I'm going to have to stop because I don't want to talk about that because his brother is here and I'd rather he talk about that. They, they, they pulled us together to do something that I think that was health and healing, but it pulled us together as a neighborhood. And so I'm just going to stop right there for now. My emotion has been getting to work on me, but I'm glad his brother's here. And so. I'll let him take it from there, and then I'll, we'll come back and talk a little bit more. I just want to thank you right now for this time. Hello, my name is Roscoe E. Jenkins. Uh, my friends affectionately call me Rock. I have no problem with the name Roscoe Jenkins, but it sounded pretty good, and I kind of like it. Then I come to find out a lot of my friends weren't my friends because they called me other names other than Rock <laughs> or uh, Roscoe Jenkins. Um, I'm glad that I spent my young adult life in Michigan because it prepared me for anywhere I could go in the world today. I feel like uh, a lot of the things, and I'm, I'm not trying to be the dead horse, but it is what it is. Racism in Marion was practiced uh, just like ordering a cup of coffee, uh, uh -huh. you know, and people don't realize, you know, just how bad it was. Uh, it was a lot of normalcy in the white race here in Marion because that's what they did. They were brought up that way uh, primarily in the rural area and it spread it uh, here or people that were well to do felt like, uh, well, we we're not racist because, you know, we, we give this and we give uh, we give your mom the opportunity to clean our house. Uh, 
raise our kids, and the only difference basically is it was practice here, not in the South. Um, I don't feel, I, <clears throat> I can give you a prime example of racism that was practiced. Um, I wanted to go and get something to eat once. <clears throat> I'm about 13, 14 years old. I stopped by Tony's Steakhouse. Oh, oh I couldn't believe it. I uh, wanted to get a hamburger. I attempted to go in and was immediately stopped at the door. He told me I could put it in a doggy bag. You can take it with me, which I didn't. You know, I left it because I felt like my uh, my being was more valuable than feeding my appetite with a well-placed uh, message that you're not welcome here. And the only thing that I can think was it had to be the color of my skin. Uh, I don't want to touch on the Orpheum Theater. I, uh, I look back with pride because I rebelled against sitting down upstairs. Not that I didn't want to sit with my people. It's just that every once in a while, I'm going to put you to the test because I'm going to go straight downstairs. Seats were too close. I couldn't cross my legs, but I was down there. So when I got ready to go upstairs, I went upstairs. I was warned by um, uh, the ushers who were usually uh, students, but they're well trained. They were very well trained. They weren't afraid of you either, because they've been given instructions. If you see one black person down there, you go and tell them you have to go upstairs. And I say to myself, oh, I don't think so. So I sit there. I sit there, actually, I'll sit there and wait. Sometimes I'll wait on the police come. <laughs> and then I, you know, being young, that young, I decided not to. I said, well, I made my point by going upstairs. But every once in a while, I, I tested the waters, you know. <laughs> um, the extreme racism that, that I encountered was the needless killing of my brother, which was racially motivated. See, they, they called it a cold case. And to me, Nobody wants cold food, so they don't want to deal with it. It's the same thing as saying, well, it's not that big a deal. Pretty much saying, well, he's black. They'll get over it. I wanted to start a campaign. My mother looked at me, and <clears throat> I talked about it with her. This is several years ago, and I made her a promise, which is the only reason that I have not She said, please don't do that. I, I don't want to go through that. And I promised her that I wouldn't. But I told myself, though, if she goes before I do, oh, it's going to be over. I know some people wonder, they ask me, you know, they wonder why I haven't stepped forward to do that. That's the sole reason and the only reason. Because I, I fear no man about anything, what you might do if I do this, or, or, you know. And I'm experiencing, oh, God, you're talking about racism. Even in my neighborhood, you know, I look around and I see the trucks flying with the with the flags and uh, the remake of the new flag with the old flag. I'm a veteran, it, you know, it, it really, it bothers me. It bothers me a lot, you know. It's not about the flag, it's about what you're trying to make it out to be and the reason why. Well, I feel like it's anger. 
because people were told that it's uh, an atrocity to have a rebel flag flying, you know, so we're just making us a new one. Well, we don't have to listen. We don't have to hear that. We just remake the flag, and we don't care what it represents or what. There are some things in the song. I, uh, I know at a young age, I, you know, I realize, you know, that I'm better, much better than you make me out to be. I remember one instance where I was in the, I was in the band. Um, he was playing the national anthem, and I didn't, I didn't stand, I didn't stand up even at that time, you know. I attribute a lot of that to some of the treatment that I got from my classmates, you know, my white classmates, my white uh, so-called people that were supposed to have an equilibrium about being with you and, and, and going through the same thing as far as trying to get an education uh, to touch on some of the things that double school, you know. There's a, there's a lot of things that when I got to junior high, I didn't have a clue. You know, I did not have a clue of what they were talking about, how you got to it. Uh, algebra? I didn't know algebra. I didn't know what algebra. You know, I'm thinking, well, what is algebra? I'm thinking it's a, it's a condition or something. You know, I don't know what it is. I don't want algebra. I don't know nothing about it. But as time went by, I, I learned that a lot of things that I would need later on in life, then I finally got a, a chance to, to realize, well, this is what I'm going to need. This is what I'm going to need. And a lot of it, I still didn't realize it until until I got out of school. I was a much better student. I guess it had something to do with counting my money when I got paid. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't want to dwell too long. I'm kind of like my brother here. If I dwell too long on, on uh, what should have happened that didn't happen, you know. You know, we marched. We marched a peaceful, very peaceful march. Nobody allowed. Uh, indignant or anything, we walked up town and we had our chance. We had chance, and we talked to the state's attorney, just like he was. Uh, uh, he was appointed to listen and to reassure us that no atrocities will be welcome in this town, this community, this. This county or nothing. And we we proceeded to ask questions about is there a possibility that this could never even uh, never even happen. Anything just uh, the word of justice would be adhered to any kind of way. We even point blank asked, is there any way he could ask or or any way anybody could ask for a speedy trial and get off in that particular manner. And we were promised and reassured that this would not and could not happen. Not here. Guess what? No speedy trial. So, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm not going to dwell on that. I just want to make a point of it. Um, I get a little angry. Um, I actually forgive the person. It took me a long time, but I had peace. I had inner peace by doing that. So I forgave. You never forget, but I forgave. And that made me twice, twice the person that actually got off, maybe twice the person that was in charge of justice, even though he held political office. 
and and I'm, I wouldn't I would never divulge his name. I could give you the initial. It's an old saying, you know, when, uh, when people do you wrong, you know, say, well, whatever happens, let, let God, let God, let God do it, let God take care of it. But we still need to have some type of foundation, and that will happen. You know, sometimes, some type of being, some type of, well, not, I don't mean rhetoric or, something that we're accustomed to these days. I mean actual, actual, peaceful way of doing it. But just let it be known that this was tolerated and something like this could be, could happen again. I'm too old to worry about something like that. I just wouldn't want my mother to go through the same thing she went through once before. Especially being the icon that she is in this neighborhood, you know, so much. You know, she raised a lot of kids, and she raised a bunch of kids. That's right. There's so much that she's done that I have to recognize. I have to let people know. I, I talk about it continuously. You know, so to me, she's a. I, I put her. I put her in the same category with with. Uh, Harry Tubman, she's history. That's right. I put her there. You know, if I put her on the pedestal, she deserves to be there. Mm, yes. You know, we're talking about we're talking about a woman that dressed kids that weren't hers. Mm -hmm. When their mother had to go and clean other folks' houses, well, she dressed them and sent them off to school. They want to jump on you if you spank one of them. Mm -hmm. Bless Marion, because I feel like I just, I wouldn't been a man, nowhere near the man that that I became later on in life, you know, because I'd have been lost. There was camaraderie here, oh, we had our little spats and our fights and everything, but nobody could come from any other town, anywhere else, and do nothing to anybody here in Marion. And the next day, we might still be squabbling, but there was camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so, and I, I enjoyed that. You know. So, I, uh, and to end this, I'm, I'm going to touch on what I was saying about black history. When I worked in California, I, would, I drove a bus, drove a transit bus, and we would, uh, we would uh, have Black History, when, you know, in February. We had the shortest day of the month, but it's still, you know, we work on that too. But uh, I sent, well, I brought back with me a, a full page column that, that Ms. Dorothy Carter was interviewed on. And I took it back, and all the things that was on the bulletin board at, at uh, where I worked. There was Martin Luther King, Harry Tubman, Jesse Owen, and that full page of Mr. Dorothy Carter was posted right behind Martin, right beside Martin Luther King. And they said, that's history. That's history right there. She's 103 years old. She's seen a lot of stuff. Good, bad, and indifferent. Right. You know, so I'm going to leave it at that. And I hope that, but I hope, I hope we, we can get something positive from what we're doing here now. And I hope people just, just recognize that there are still a lot of work to be done. You know, we're, we're just, I mean, it's not as bad as it was, but there right now, there's a probably a 75% probability that it's just around the corner if we don't, if we don't nip it in the wood now.
and and actually, uh, you know, I have a little heart of friends in different nationalities. You know, it's not it's not the people. It's the person that wants to involve himself with the wrong people and provide that spark. You know. Provide the spark that people need. So I'm going to leave it at that and thank you very much. My name is Gary Allen. Gary with two R's. I don't talk to you today, I'll talk to you tomorrow. I've been to school in three different cities Chicago, Marion, and Carville, Illinois. I have two things I would like to express. First is that I'd like to be accurate as I can be. I'm pushing 77 years old, so I try to don't want to fabricate or get things misquoted so someone with my brothers here and sisters can correct me. I have no problem with that. And secondly, is that there are people that are older than me and some younger than me, they may have more accurate count of some things as they saw it. But as my sister said earlier, this is my viewpoint from where I stood at particular times certain things were about. I going to sound a little naive here, perhaps to some people. Personally, I don't care. I really don't care too much about what people's opinions are. But I put it this way, so it may sound like I don't really account too much what I call racism in my viewpoint because I think that I'm an individual, I'm a human being, and I do have uh, something what they call pride in the sense that I think no man, no man is better than me, and I'm not better than them. So I kind of looked at things, even though I will touch some points about racism, but basically, uh, words never affect me. <laughs> I thought they were talking to somebody else, where I try to genderize my thinking. Um, for as uh, I understand that we're going to be grouping together a little later on my brother and my, uh, my other brother here, talking about some events. So, um, I'm going to say this, since I've got a little input from the other two speaking. I can recall certain things, but I also can recall certain things, how I handle things. Basically, um, I was taught what I've known I was taught, but it was just understanding that you respect older people. So whoever was in authority over me as growing up as a young person, regardless of color, you gave them respect. Mm -hmm. That was just embedded until you didn't get smart back to the teacher or the whoever was in charge of you. But I do remember I will share uh, since it seems like I'm going this way, a few things that was racism that probably stood out for me. I remember when um, I made the basketball team in junior high, and one of the uh, players, uh, which I was the only black kid on the team, but one of the players. Uh, made a, I don't use ethical names, I don't talk about Polish people with that name, I don't talk about Polish, uh, Puerto Ricans in a certain way, and I don't talk about uh, Mexicans, I don't use the black narrative, the N-word, I, I, I really refrain for those words. But I, for this uh, case, I would say, he said the last one, if you can follow me, see the last one, two shots, a red-headed nigga. Um, I kind of smiled one further because 
like I say, I'm kind of arrogant in my way. <laughs> you ain't come to me, and I'm just never put nobody ahead of me. So I just didn't look at it. So then down, I started running with him. I thought I want to be last. So anyway, I ran with him. Then I, I uh, decided what was it about. You know, it was talking about me, basically, you know, in their little slide way. So I cornered the person in the shower. And I threatened him. I was very skinny. And, um, but it was to me to tell it, I would fight anybody, anywhere, and any time. I was two or three. But anyway, um, we called the coach. And the coach uh, talked to the other group of boys and told them why I was there, that that was wrong for them to do that. We all was a team, that's philosophy, you know, how they do a team, stick together and all that. But I listened to him. And it made me feel pretty good, but he got on. Then he came to me and he told me, he said, listen, Alan, he says, uh, basically, uh, I can remember, and I'm saying you're talking about 1957, but he basically said, well, look, now, you have to kind of expect that. You're the only one like this, and just imagine if it was all black team, well, I think they said color team then, but anyway, uh, and we had one white boy in there, you know something will be said about them. Well, in my little pea brain kind of thinking, that sound, yeah, that's, that's reasonable. But I also felt uh, a little something, it was just a passerby. Now that's what I thought, it's just kind of like to settle things down. Anyway, that was one thing that I can remember kind of raising. And it happened again, didn't happen right away, but it was said just low enough. The other time it was real loud, low enough. And again, I ran with the rest of them, I didn't do anything. So that's one thing, but I think the, I'm going about racism for me and other people, uh, non color, color, and I say white, Caucasian, whatever. Um, the one was when I was a senior in high school. And um, I, I think that's what they call you go to the uh, counselor and you tell him what you think. This counselor <laughs> told me, he asked me what I like to do. And I said, well, I thought I was pretty good in ball playing. I could tell you about racism and that, but I was very good, I thought, very good at baseball, in which they didn't have boxing, so I know I was good at that. But anyway, um, he told me, I told him, I'd like to think I'm going to be a pro ball player. But then I might try to go to college, you know, like that. He told me in these short words, well, you're not college material. The best thing for you to do <laughs> is go to Chicago and get you a job in the factory. I took that so like, but I've always, I'm saying why I took it. It didn't hurt me. It made me, what you thought, say, angry. And realize this, this uh, council should not be talking to a teenager like this. No encouragement is just telling me, you know, I'm going to go get in the factory like you know, you didn't have no skills like that. Even though my dreams, you know, when you're young, you think you can do this and do that, just get away, you know. So anyway, I took that and I kind of smiled at him. And answer to that was, yes, I didn't take the courses that it should prepare me. And like uh, my friend Rock said earlier, <laughs> when I went to junior high, I didn't know about no algebra. Uh, so I go, pie and why and uh, <laughs> it kind of messed me up, you know. And I was good at math. But I could, I could multiplication fractions. I was good at that. But we come up with something else that was throwing. I was, I was I mean, so smart, you know, like that. But it never. And this is what I'm trying to say, basically, for me as my person, I never put no nationality above me. And I'm a very proud person by being black. Uh, I do have prejudice, and I realized a long time ago, because I was like to say, I'm not a person, person is what it is. But I remember very well about every time trying to kind of win. My nickname is Gabby, by the way. Got that in 1966. 
I used to never talk, now I started talking ever since then. As I came out of the army, my dad named me, named me Gabby. But um, I remember watching a boxing match, and at the time you didn't, I was always for the black, the black fighter, you know, we, we need some recognition, we need to go there. Um, and um, the black boxer uh, beat this white boxer real bad. And it was over, it was over with, and they had an interview with the white box that got beat. He said, well, he's just too good for me, he was a better person than me. And then when they get interviewed with the black boxer, he said, oh, I kicked his, and he used the lambs that he wanted, I kicked his mama's butt like that. It hurt my feelings, because he's just too good for the fact. Then I realized I was going because the guy was colored, black, as I said back, back then, colored. I took him just because he was black. Yeah. After then, I said, yeah, you, my little pea brain, I'm thinking, yeah, you present for that. Then I made a vow, not a vow, just to myself, no, I'm not going by a colored person's skin, their character, as Martin Luther King said. Yeah. I started dealing with the, the idea of this person's talking to me, right, this person's treating me, this person's like that. I put that more in my brain. So when I started talking to you all at this first start, I tell you, Maybe a little naive about prejudice because I start looking at everybody. This is not my enemy. The only way you enemy me that you're doing something to me or something to my family or to someone that is what they call you know it's not right. Thank you very much. And that's just my account. I got a little Forrest Gump in me. Uh, if you know what I'm talking about, I don't see things quite like everybody. I, it kind of rides on my head. You know, I just kind of take for what it is. You have heard from these gentlemen, I, Carmen Ellen Dale again, but I do have a journey, and I'm younger than them by 10 and 11 years. That same neighborhood, although my truth was a whole lot different than theirs, and it's simply this. First of all, I was proud of the neighborhood. I was proud of going to Douglas School. I had my chest stuck out, shoulders back, and marched and stepped high because I went to Douglas School. It was segregated. A few things I learned. Now, kind of, the prejudice goes a lot deeper than what people think. So even in our neighborhood, there are prejudices. Because there's nothing that's gone on today that didn't happen then. First of all, I was, let me talk about Douglas School. Douglas School gave me a source of pride that I will always cherish to this day. Because in Douglas School, from the first, from the kindergarten till the fifth grade, I remember my principal role model, Mrs. Claire Kirk. Black woman, strong black woman. My teacher, Russell Duncan, Aunt Russell, strong black woman. So those were my role models. I'm inspired to be a teacher, a lawyer, a journalist, all of the above, and then some more. But those were my role in my formative years. Those were my role models. I looked around in the school. I think Miss Edna Ross was the um, cook, black also. The janitor, Mr. Nelson Barnett, black also. So I had a sense of pride, everything around me. Now, I actually lived in two different worlds. Grew up in Marion, <clears throat> but I had, my mom came from Carbondale. So common, living in Marion was like two different worlds. Going to Carbondale was progressive, integrated. Marion, I was annoyed, I was mad half the time, but I was proud. I had a kind of mother put me in tap dance and I was the only one in there. Me and my cousin Nadine, we out at the VA tap dance and I hated it so bad while they turned them one way, I was the other way dancing to Katie Kangaroo. I just hated it. <laughs> she had me in band, I played the clarinet. And that was okay, but we I had to be bused every day to Logan Gym. It was a Logan school there at that time to play. 
And everybody would wait on you to come in and get yourself seated. So you were already feeling segregated by the fact they looking at you. Here come that colored girl, because that's what we were called then. Well, let me just pause and stay with Douglas School. <clears throat> I was so happy to get back to my school every day. It was, it was comforting. But in that, there were also some prejudices. Because you see, Marin is made up of many levels and many dynamics. So in school, being from 11 people and being from nothing new was going on that wasn't then, we were called, the Allen children, half-breeds. Because we came from a biracial family. And so when they didn't like y'all, you're a half-breed anyway. So it got to where I didn't care much for the black folks neither. I wasn't black enough in the black school, but when we desegregated, I was never going to be white. And then when it came time to go to the sixth grade, went to Logan School, and there you are sitting all by yourself. And every time they showed a slave or mentioned something about a slave, they all looked at you like you had first-hand knowledge. <laughs> And I would look back at him like, who are you looking at? Because I still was a rebel. And although they shared different stories, I was well read. My, te my teacher was my aunt, and she kept, she kept me up on everything. Reader's Digest was my main source. In the summer, she took me on vacations. So I was well traveled as well. Went to Carbondale, my grandparents and mother, they all went to SIU. So I lived two different worlds now. We get into the 60s, I'm still feeling a little shaky about this transition because my sister, younger sister, hated so much. She used to walk home every single day, hated school with the passion when we had to desegregate. And she was a straight-A student in both schools. So I kind of was never behind, but I was, like my brother Gabby said, I always thought, I'm better than you. Jane, nobody going to tell me that I'm less, because I'm the best. And that was my mindset. But also, there was some turmoil in the 70s, like um, Brother Rock alluded to. There was a march. In that process, my mother was from Carbondale, so while I'm in the very segregated Marion, although we had desegregated, there was, they still let you know that you were not white. And one of them, before I move on, one of them was my father at one time worked for housing. I learned how I got my learner's permit. So I begged my mother, let me go, let me go over there to my dad. I went over there. Now, I don't know why they didn't know, but they didn't. I went over to the ones right off of Court Street. They were brand new then, fairly new. And I asked for Bowman Allen, the older, White lady goes, hey, Bowman, there's a little nigga out here looking for you. Well, I don't know that what, all I remember, first time my father was kind of laid back. But he came unglued and, and uncivilized at that point. <laughs> and he, he told, he read her her rights from up, down, sideways, and everywhere, and told her that was his daughter. And uh, I felt real good, but then again, my brothers always said I was his favorite. So, you know, I was feeling all good and chest all out. And I, I couldn't wait to get home and tell him, yeah, my, my pet name for my dad, Bobby. I said, and he gave it to her. I was just happy as a lark. So, he had an ism about that anyway. Because, you see, we went through several levels of uh, prejudice. It wasn't just one way. So, that's why this film will bring out a lot of other levels. And that's what I mean by the kids of now today need to know their past. Because in the process of going forward, they actually lost a lot of their culture and heritage. We had black churches. We had five. I believe it was five. Four at least that I can remember. And guess what? Everybody went to church. You learned the Negro National Anthem. And now they won't even stand because they don't even know what it is our younger group. They, we have lost our culture and we have tried to assimilate. And in doing so, we have gotten rude. 
who don't respect our elders. They talk to you any kind of way, and for that is one of the drawbacks. While we may have gone ahead, I hear people say, stop, you're militant, Carmen, you're militant. You need to come with the future. Stop complaining about the past. My answer to this, and I will close with this. I will get in the past, I will get out of the past when you open that door in Marion. You opened it and you let me look through, but you ain't never let me in the future. We are not any, we have nothing more than what we had then. We had no black police officers, we had no black firemen. We have a couple of directors, which you'll learn about later. Boyden Street is one of the things that came out of that, that march. But we haven't, while we have gone forward, we're still in the same place. And that is my point, and hoping that this, this, this documentary and healing will just open people's eyes. I want to be in the future, but I don't need you to let me in. I'm tired of people in Marion. I had to leave to become a police officer become a lieutenant in the Department of Corrections for well over 25 years. And that's a shame when you have to leave your hometown to be something and someone. Mm -hmm. And to come back to see the same things here. Ain't we can be a side note, but we cannot have a seat at the big table. And with that, I'll leave. In 26, the first principal, he's from Carpendale. I can go, I can give you a whole bunch of stuff. Well, I tell you, Uncle Arch and Uncle Jesse, Carissa, I mean, uh, Garmin sent me the picture with Uncle Arch and Uncle Jesse and all those men. Down in Teen Town? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Teen Town. I was glad to see mm -hmm. that. Talking, I was thinking about when me and Jerry Ray, you know, when they had a bird shaft there, mm -hmm. we went off across the tracks to go get some milk check and a hamburger. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we were coming around to get around the track, we left a burger shaft. I remember these all these white boys in there. Car, young white boy, yeah. and I remember them shooting at us. Oh, yeah. Me and Jerry I went to running around by duck and running, probably got behind the burger <laughs> chip, <laughs> and, and then hit the tracks. So, you know. oh. we knew then, you know, they were having fun in the car, but, you know, even these young white teenagers, I figured they thought they was having fun, but what if they killed one of us or shot one of them? It, it wouldn't have been fun for us. Mm -hmm. But when that when that twenty two hit that rail, ping, and I said, I said, they're real bullets. I said, I told you they were real bullets. <laughs> you know, uh, I think all three of us army. But one of the things that I really bothered me about being a veteran, I mean major, it ain't about Vietnam with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a serious problem here. I remember the movement with um, Cassius Clay, or if you will, Muhammad Ali, when. Mm -hmm. They wanted to imprison him because he wouldn't go and wouldn't accept the draft. Right. And uh, I remember that always burned me because one minute they, you want to tell us to go back to Africa, and the next minute you tell us, hey, uh, you don't want to fight for your country. So it's like, well, you won't fight for your country. So we here we are, the three black of us, we go to war, do whatever they want us to do because we're in the military. Because now once we come back, when we all came back, we was niggers again, couldn't rent in a certain neighborhood, couldn't get certain jobs. So who was it, who was benefiting from the war? He was mad at us if we didn't go. But when we come back, you rejected us like you did before we went. So we didn't have a win no kind of way, and that would always bother me. And I remember I said, well, I'm a veteran, because the guys told me, say, just tell me you're a veteran when you get back. It didn't move them at all when I'd say I'm a veteran. And I remember several of them would say, well, son, most of us are veterans. Mm -hmm. That was not what I wanted to hear, and that's not what I was told what happened. And I thought about that over and over again. And I, I used to think back then, we ever going to win anything? Yeah, was. And every one of us, now we sat here, but you know it's a fact. Every one of us, to achieve something, had to leave home. Had to leave man and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm to really get a broader perspective of being black and proud of it. Mm -hmm. And also a chance to uh, educate ourselves and get a good job, right. paying job. Then all of us did that. Then we had to come back and try to give something back to Marion. Mm -hmm. But we had to go away. You realize it's black history that we always had to go away from that prejudiced neighborhood right. Right. and then bring, then bring something back to that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so nothing to me has changed today mm -hmm. in that sense because we still have to go away in order to come back to give this neighborhood something so they don't suffer under the pressure yeah. that we did. Yeah. And I, I used to think, man, 
Isn't there ever going to be a change? Isn't there ever something going to uh, make a difference? And I, when I watch these young black, uh, young men and women today, I get in real trouble mm -hmm. because they don't say to the young ladies, they so used to call them the bad, the B word, mm -hmm. instead of calling the young lady what her name is, right. you give them that B word, and you know, we were raised, you don't even talk that way. Mm -hmm. And now that's the way they call them on the playground, and you know, this. I said, we can't talk to that. Mm -hmm. Don't be talking to them young ladies like that. And then the next thing you know, I'm hearing all this constant cussing and swearing. Never stops. And I'm think and the one thing we remember about, we say, hey young man, you shouldn't talk like that. That don't sound right. And they look at you like, who are you, old man? You don't be telling us. My mama don't you know don't look at it this and I'm thinking, yeah. we were taught to respect your elders. Mm -hmm. You know, and listen. And I look at these a lot of these young men today. They don't know their history. And I look at that and they have no idea the price some of us had to pay in dying or getting beatings mm -hmm. to make sure we got integrated. And I look at this young black generation behind us, a lot of them, they, they're not educated. They want to talk this stuff. They have no idea mm -hmm. where they come from. They don't appreciate the older blacks who made it possible for them and maybe a lot of that's our fault too, we should educate them. I yeah. did my kids, yeah. where they come from. But I look at that rock, and, uh, and Gary and I, I thought about this center, we sitting in here doing this today. Mm -hmm. And I thought about, of course, all this come about through the, the horrible murder of your brother. Mm -hmm. And we got together and, and uh, formed the Black Brothers for Progress. Right. To make a change after we listened to that uh, Senator or Representative from Marion, Mr. KP, I'll call him his name, KP, and, uh, and he told us and then he swept that under the rug. But I remember how angry we got. Oh, yeah. And I remember Reverend Buchanan and his wife said, look, don't, don't you guys take up arms, because we was getting together to take up arms. Mm -hmm. And I remember Reverend Buchanan sat down and talked with us. He said, look, I know you got to do something, but don't do it violently. And I, I, I remember back then, he talked us into, okay, have a demonstration. And so we did that demonstration, and then when we watched all around how we want justice, we want justice. At that time, the law knew they wasn't going to stop us. Mm -hmm. But I like what Reverend Buchanan said to me, he said, well, I know, but I don't want nobody with a pick, uh, with a tooth, with an ice pick, I don't want a knife, I don't want no guns. I don't want no plastic guns. He was saying, I don't want no plastic knives. I don't want no real knives. Mm -hmm. He said, I want you to be able to do this non-violently. But your voices need to be heard. We, they need to know that we're not satisfied with the overlooking of this tragic murder. And so I thought about, out of that demonstration came a movement yeah. that first time, to me, ever, when we came together as in, a, in the neighborhood, as a black community mm -hmm. in that neighborhood, putting things together. I remember my brother Gary and I, I think WSIL was in Harrisburg, Gary and I had on our bands and stuff and we was talking over the, the newsman, he was interviewing us on TV. I don't know if you remember that or not, Gary, and uh, some black white folk were calling male and female, hey, you better get off there, you know what's going to happen to you. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> And yeah, I, remember, I, don't, I don't remember. Yeah, and he had, and I remember he asked. I probably would went after him. Man. Yeah, well, we were sitting there being interviewed, and he says, "Well, what do you think about these phone calls that's coming in right now?" <laughs> and I, oh, we can think, well, you know, we got to go back home when we leave here, <laughs> get back to Marion. But I thought about when all those things happen, and in the neighborhood today. How, I'll tell you the truth, you guys, it looked like we didn't go very far or something happened and that got lost in all that shuffle and we come together and put that thing together and when we created this, we out of that movement, we got together, got organized, we had Reverend Cannon and different ones coming, we got organized or they were forced to listen to us to some degree. They had, they had a I, I, the, I think the white city officials realized we got to do something before the lid blows off and these, these, this whole black community has done come together, we got to do something. And when we formed that Black Brothers for Progress, I thought that was the beginning of something because now they had to legally listen to us. They had to work out something so they wouldn't be rioting in the street. And I remember we got to working and working with them and the next thing you know we wanted our own center. 
because of walking way out there in the white neighborhood, trying to go to the teen town. It used to be up around the square. They wouldn't yep. accept us. Right, we couldn't go to the white teen town. And so I remember when we, when we come together, the Black Brothers of Progress. That's how this place got here. Now let me. Boyd Street. Yeah. Let me. Yeah. Let me. Boyd Street Center. Yeah. Let me hit a couple things with you on some things. That yeah. Um, first of all, uh, like I said, in 1963, in 1962, we heard that we could not go up to the white team town. You know, the IRS had closed down. Or I can't remember the name of it. Me, Bobby Tolley, and Vernon Rogers went up there. Again, we're looking for a confrontation. That's the way I look at it. You know, that was the what we're fighting. Went up there, and I'm telling like I saw it, like I remember. <laughs> Nothing happened. And mostly, I believe, because, uh, you know, Bobby and uh, Vern were real good athletes, and they played the sports with them. So, hey, man, hey, man. And I was kind of hardballing and thing because, you know, the sports I excelled in, they already, like baseball, they already said, well, we've got a team already picked. I'm black, I'm supposed to be able to run slow. I could learn later I could really run distance, but I didn't know that until I got in the army. So I wasn't in it like and couldn't play football. I mean I could play at a hit, but I couldn't do anything. I had no speed and all that kind of stuff. It's a lot. It's it's so much, you know, it's so much that we that we have gone through, you know, and, and I'm not gonna be repetitious on this either. Yeah. But it, it, it it helps me to know that, that um, a lot of things that we did and said, you know, came to uh, came to be a lot of things that are today that are positive, mm -hmm. you know. And as far as uh, the the generation now, you know, being a bus driver, you know, it's it's amazing what you hear, what you see, mm -hmm. and and. Uh, I know we have an authority, authoritative uh, position, you know, that, you know, you, you know what I'm oh, saying. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> goodness. I, I get home, you know, we, we, you know, we work like maybe 20 hours. Those 20 hours, man, you know, when you get off, you, you just dead tired, you yeah. know. And I take care of my mother, you know, in the, in the evening. Well, I'm supposed to be your alert and anything you need, da 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 da. And all I hear is, uh, you sleep? <laughs> you know, that's, the, you know that's, that's what it's called. You sleep? Oh, no, I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> you know? But, you know, you, 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 you have, I realize that there's a certain things, because you got all kinds of, you know, even when I work with the Department of Correction, you got if you got sixty people, you got sixty individual minds, and the only time those minds come together is when they're in a group, or they feel that they need to be comrades at arm, mm. or however they're thinking about it. Yeah, you know, and. Uh, I know I'm qualified to work with you, you know, because that's all I've done all my life. Yes. You know, it's working uh, in juvenile, you know. Uh, I, I remember when I moved to Springfield and I put in for some jobs. You know, at that particular time, you know, it wasn't a lot of jobs. It was a political town. So you had to know somebody to get hired. Uh, good jobs, but I put in for three uh, three positions, one at Sheridan, one at uh, uh, Valley View, and one at St. Charles. And God was with me. When we went to, uh, I got a picture with the, uh, Reverend Phillips, we was uh, talking about um, needing a community center or getting us together, you know, as black and neighbors being more of things. And, um, I think I, this may be a little foggy what I said, but anyway, I remember uh, mm -hmm. having to talk with the mayor, and they said, "Well, we don't have to worry to me or something." When I was teen town, and they closed it down, they opened that one uh, down there where the teen town was, you know. 
By the way, I, had, I drew a part of a miracle down there still on the wall when they won some black ribbon in the case of the could draw a little bit of paint. But anyway, um, Mary said, well, if y'all show some initiative by tearing down the building, the old building, we'll build you a center. I said, okay, so I kind of talked to the people, some people in the neighborhood, and quite naturally, and I put it this way, because the way I was thinking then, the way I saw it then, but now we got a chance to do something. Well, everybody's too busy that Saturday, they didn't want to go, or this and didn't do this. So I came out from my job, which I, I believe at this time I was working in the coal mine. I had a little uh, Indian tractor, right, and got a 76, whatever it was. I start coming off my job, start taking things. Well, the Jones boy, Mr. William and Bill, uh, built houses a lot of times, and they uh, approached me in some kind of way, said, well, what you going to do that? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, we'll tear it down because they're going to use something. I said, yeah, because I'm going to destroy it. So, them two. But as I remember, at this time, there was more one young black person, which is younger than me, was uh, Ricky Lacey. Help me, you know, because we get up on the roof and I was ripping off stuff like that. Eventually, I'd like to say, some more joined, but it wasn't consistent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Saturday was his day, and that's the day everybody, you know, they worked or whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. They won't be spending time up there and what forward, don't see the light, you know, at the end of the tunnel. Yes. But I'm going by what the mayor had said. Well, at that time, we got the center, we got that place cleaned up. He wanted to see some black. Mm -hmm. Interesting, like we're gonna do this for you. We don't show y'all what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. So I, I bought into what he said, and wow. it sounded good. And that's right, like, yeah, I like to see us do something too. James Brown said, Get it myself, you know. You know, that's why I felt like, okay, I don't want no handouts, I want to do something, but you know. So, anyway, uh, some kind of way, someone even called me, not this may be a little foggy with me, said that I guess the WSIL wanted to interview. Somebody they knew about the building they was going to do. Mm -hmm. And I was pointing out the person to do it. Well, right here, was, this wasn't here. This center wasn't here. It was right here on this vacant lot. And uh, <laughs> I'm a little cautious about what you put on this head, too, because they didn't print what I said in the paper and they changed it. Like, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you about that, too. So I had the interview and had the mic in front of me. said, Well, here we are with uh, Gary Allen, what I was saying that uh, someone told me uh, the, the interview. So when the guy, the, the woman held the mic on TV, but just before that, I said, she, I said, well, what am I supposed to do? I just told that you were going to interview about the center. She said, well, just, you know, just tell what it, what it is. So I'm on that mic, and she said, well, uh, I understand this is 1987, almost 87, yeah, and you tore down the building, you and your helpers, back in 84, 83. He said, it's been three years since you had a center or anything. What do you think about that? I said, well, I got ready to answer it. And I'm trying to use what my family was trying to really talk, really, what's he got to be tactful, you know, because I tell them, well, I'll tell you what I think. So I was trying to use some of their charisma. I said, well, I believe they're going to do it, you know, and I sent it that way, you know. And so the lady put the mic back on and she said, well, here we are. Mr. Allen said the mayor hasn't done what he said he's going to do. <laughs> and, and I'm looking at, well, I'm on TV. I don't want to look like, like this. So I'm saying, that, oh, my God, I'm going to, you know, like that. So anyway, when it came out, then the newspaper put out, Allen upset with, as I had that article for a long time about what thing was done. So next thing I know, Oddly enough, the ball speeded up. <laughs> it really speeded. I was in the, it had to be in the winter because it was cold out there when it was at the field. And we began to get the, the building built here. Now, in the meantime, I got some paperwork here. We was meeting at the uh, Baptist Church, CCC, uh, -C -C -C, Coalition of Concerned Citizens. I think that's what it's called. And I have another uh, CDC, uh, what I found with the boys, Committee for Decency. I got all kinds of little programs, Black mm -hmm. Girls Brothers, One Boys to Men, like that. I just showed me him. He was vice president when he was vice president. 
so many other things. Uh, down, you know, when we had the, the other group that you was a part of. But what I'm saying is about the center, uh, we were able to get it. We had decided at that time, not taking so long, that we was in a position that we had enough carpenters here, people knew electricians. Now, this is where we were going when we had that uh, meeting at the Baptist Church, that we could do it. I said, we didn't want the city to do anything, but we've been waiting on a long time. Mm -hmm. And we did like that. Well, actually, as my memory serves me, they said, but how are we going to fund it? Because, you know, we, quote, unquote, it's black, it's late, uh, paying dues, and nobody can't see the light of the tunnel, they ain't going to be putting the money in, to, who's going to help keep it, who's going to do this? You know, you start getting that fight in months itself. So uh, I strongly suggested that, well, let the city build it. We'll control it. Just let them say, well, see, I didn't know all the ins and outs about what was going on, the rainbow type of thing, you know, umbrella, I mean. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's how it, it got built at that interview. Quickly, it started being built. And then we had to decide who they wanted to be the first uh, director. As I imagine you have heard the gentlemen speak their truths. So here we come to the end of my story. And the end is the birth and the beginning. The end is not the end, it's just the beginning. And after all that came out of the marches is Miss Stephanie Willis. Stephanie and I have had a long-standing relationship. Uh, we've, tackled, we've tackled some hard problems and some that we wasn't sure that we were going to make it through. But Stephanie is at the, the face of Boynton Center. She is our one and only director. And thank God she's been here with us so many years. Stephanie, would you like to tell them when you first came in as a young lady, probably overwhelmed? Uh, yes. When I first came into being a director, Mayor Bob Butler came to my house, knocked on the door, and asked me if I would take the position. At the time, I was um, going to take a job as manager over at Carnival Shoes, and uh, I thought that would be better for me because I was also going to school at SIU. So uh, he asked me if I would take the job, and I him hard because I wasn't aware. You know, I was young when all this started. Um, and in high school and what year. Um, so he asked me and I said yes, I would take the job. Um, mainly for the satisfaction of my godfather, Jim Dale Marshall. <laughs> Basically. Um, so he gave me a key and when I came in here there was nothing in here but I think a table for the board. I think they had a table and about nine chairs, because at the time I think there was nine on the board. And so uh, we would have uh, their once a month meetings, and um, it was difficult because it was almost like I was the enemy because I was hired. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't someone that was involved, although people knew me. So it was difficult. So um, I want to back up because when I took the job and I asked the, the mayor what did he want done, and he, the first thing he said was, well, you need to uh, come up with some programs for uh, literacy because they can't read. And he said, I mean, you also need to come up with uh, maybe some hygiene programs because they don't smell good. I don't know who they was, but I figured it out. Um, so, <laughs> so that was then, and this is now. So through all the reading and the hygiene and all that stuff, we've done even more things. Leadership for young people. You were talking about the young people that have come through here, and there's been a lot of them. Before you get to the young people, I just want to back it up just a tinch. Um, at, in the early stages, there was also um, involvement with the older people. Weren't there pool tables or something? They had an adult night here. Yes. 
yes. for the socialization because this was our gathering place for all intents and purposes? Yes, there was a, a pool table here and um, I think we had a ping pong table at yes. one time. Yes, ping pong. Um, and Didn't they play cards in one table? Yeah, they played cards. Um, I think also we had a, a program for the seniors, and then that was a problem. I think I had seen in an article where uh, someone was talking about isolation, mm -hmm. uh, that this center would cause more isolation of the black population. Um, but that really wasn't the issue, not really. Um, they just needed just a place to, didn't it? Exactly. This, and they just wanted a place to, to, yeah, to socialize and to, to learn and all that stuff. The seniors, um, they were into nutrition. And there was a program uh, at the Senior Citizens about uh, nutrition, but they wanted it here. Mm -hmm. So we partnered with the uh, Williamson County Extension. And so they had um, monthly little cooking classes for the young ladies and also for the older ladies. So, yeah. Didn't Mrs. Barnett um, have a sewing class as well? Yes, she had a sewing class for the young people during the summertime. Uh, we just had so many things. If I just could go through and think about what we've done, it's just been really incredible. And again, before you mention the young people, which I'm so very proud of the accomplishments in the center, mm -hmm. I would just like you to expound a little bit on how invaluable this center has become to the neighborhood and the community, as such as all the repast dinners, all yeah. the birthdays, all the social dances, all the old folks' crochet classes. Just can you just expound on it just a little bit um, and, and let us know how important. Well, yeah, it's been important not only for the for the young people, but uh, we like to say it's a holistic approach because not only do we deal with the children, but we also deal with the parents and any kind of uh, deficiencies or issues that they have, we also address those too. So it's not only just been for the kids, it's been for the families. And not only the families in this area, but, you know, the ordinance says City of Marion. Mm -hmm. So we've seen the City of Marion here uh, participating, whether it was volunteers or people that came in for programs or whatever. It's been everybody, really. And wasn't Mrs. Poppy one of, uh, aside from the Jets community, she was one of your biggest uh, supporters as well. Yeah, uh, Kathleen Poppy was um, a literacy teacher for the Unit 2 and um, she basically did, she was a reading specialist. So when she came on board, uh, she wanted to start a tutoring program. So her and Ella Allen got together and they kind of, you know, built the basis for that and what that was then, it's the after school all stars today okay. with about 55 kids enrolled. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know most of the churches here relied heavily on the center and they came here for more than one reason sometimes car washes, yes. sometimes repasts, funerals. Yes. But it, it, it served more than one purpose and it still does. Um, it's like more than a community center, but I would call it a healing center as well. Yes, yes, yes. Um, churches have used the facility if you come in. It's always, you know, um, usually they will use it for repast, you know, um, for a deceased church member or community member. And everybody just gets together, you know, if that's a time really, it's, it's, it's sad. But um, I've got pictures and stuff that we've taken and everybody, you know, was just together and, and you know, uh, memorializing the individual and just, uh, you know, reminisce about the community. So, yeah. Well, I am so pleased that you can tell us a little bit about a lot, because this is a multi-purpose center. Yes. And folks really don't get a full understanding. And it didn't just serve 
minorities it served the Caucasian um, population as well. Yes. So I, it had everything from dances to yes. square dancing. Yes. So yes. moving along, let's go and fast forward to the to the success stories out of here. All the young people that has come through here. Yes. And there's so many, she probably is just going to have to do a general thing. Oh, well, I can't. I, yeah, you want me to kind of come up with who and No, all not that. who, how many, many have come. How many, because I don't think Hundreds. people realize how many young African American children have come through here and just really blossom and yes. took that next step that maybe Hundreds. from here. Hundreds. Uh, when we first started, the first thing we started was a 4 H program. And 4-H program had a lot of kids in it. And you know 4-H back in the day, you learned how to cook, you learned how to sew, you learned how to take care of pets and all that kind of stuff. And those kids was really into that. So much so we had the biggest 4-H group in Williamson County. We had a lot of kids that qualified for state, you know, to show their little, you know, projects or whatever. Um, that was first. Then we went from that those are basics, you know, learning how to do stuff, life skills. Then we went from that to leadership. And we want them to know that, you know, there is a place for you in the community as far as your voice and decision making. So then we had um, Black Leaders of Tomorrow. That that's, was a big one. That's what I was coming to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that was a big one. Uh, we had a lot of kids in that program, um, and they did a lot of stuff, you know, community-wise. You know, they protest, but they were organized and learned how to do it first. Peaceful way. Yes, and, and, and they protest. One of the main things they were uh, concerned with was the condition of the park, you know, and people coming in from different communities, people coming in drinking and all that kind of stuff. and. We got them organized to do that, and they got the little ones, and they all went. They had the little signs and stuff. So, so yeah, so early on, they learned how to do that kind of stuff. These were kids that were getting prepared for life outside of Marion. Mm -hmm. uh, college bound, whether it be, you know, scholarships for athletics, like your son, or, you know, scholarships, uh, my brother's. They were really big at Marion High School doing a lot of stuff, gold key winners and all that kind of stuff. We developed that here. Yes. So, so yeah, we've done a lot. So, um, but we never had the space because you know about this. <laughs> you know. Uh, yes, that yes. was one of our battles. Yes. Um, you know about that. Yeah. Well, I'm partly responsible for getting this yes. ad on and yes. because I wouldn't stop until we got that. That's right. And we've done everything from barbecues to yes. chili dinners yeah. and everything else. But yes. before that we did, we worked really hard. Uh, Reverend Holmes was a big advocate for yes. our computer system. That's right. And of course, uh, I can name a whole lot of our elders that have gone. But they were a big influence, and didn't they um, put things in place when we didn't have it? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Um, uh, was it Frances Copeland that was the first? Copeland. She was the first um, board chair, and then there was Mrs. Buchanan mm -hmm. that did a lot, um, and then Ron Ferguson. He was board chair. Could never get Gary to do it, you know. Right. Uh, when Jerry was on the board, uh, you know, he was very vocal about some things. So yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah, so we've had, you know, we've had people that have actually came in and and uh, you know, did their thing. And that and that is really what a community center is about. But I I I implore you to just understand how important it is that Board Street is here and why it is here and not to make it just any common place, because it's actually a historic place. Yes, yes, yes. And I think the, the success of it speaks volumes. I mean, because initially, you know, 
kind of from the, the attitude of the community, it wasn't supposed to work, you right. know. Um, it wasn't supposed to be, you know. So, so yeah. Okay, well thank you so very much, Ms. Willis, and I commend you and I pray that God gives you the strength to just keep on keeping on here. Grace of God. So my truth and my vision is simply this. We have an Illinois Healing Grant and my goal is to show you the path that we've taken to get to where we are today. Like I said before, it's from the 50s, 70s, till today. In doing so, I was passionate and wrote that poem because I didn't feel things had changed too much. And one of the things is we made some strides, but we have, for every five steps, we seem to go backwards. And there just has to be another answer to this. And the only way I know, with new people constantly coming into our fair city and town, I would just like them to come together and have some common understanding. Like they said, without roots, there is no tree. And there's much to be said about that. Now, the root of this particular story is Cecil. It's still not solved. It's a cold case. The ending of the poem is George Floyd. And he had a small victory. We still don't know what the end of that story is. But it invoked such a strong emotion in me. I felt there was something I need to do. And it was simply this, bring a story, bring some of the people that were of yesterday into to, and bring, them, bring you up to date. Also, perhaps in doing so you will understand why there's a urgent need to come to some kind of common, uh, common denominator so that we can start to mend mend and heal and come together as a people because the bottom line is we are all one people. We're all human. We all have the same goals. We all have the same struggles. But we just have, we've just we seen them through different eyes because we have different paths. One of the things is the systemic racism runs deep. So perhaps I can have the other side of the aisle understand that those are still very deep scars and hurts that still are very much alive today. On the other side, I'm hoping that a conversation can start so that we can understand your isms as well. Because both sides have some issues that they need to deal with, but if we can in the process merge the two, have open, honest conversations without pointing fingers, would be just great. And that is basically what I am willing and hoping that I can accomplish. Because the thing is, with Boyd Street Center, it, it it's, has multiple uses. And as we know, we have come a long way just to get it. But still, I will say this. It's like, from my Nigerian friends, I'm borrowing one of their sayings. It's like giving somebody the goat and holding on to the leash. I'm praying that that leash will be dropped and that we can start to expand and expound on a whole range of issues and things. So I hope you enjoyed the program tonight and hopefully we can start a meaningful dialogue and continue. This story. And now we can have a question and answer segment. Again, thank you.
First off, thank you everyone of you all for coming out. Uh, I believe this is a common one of those things you want to about to do. And uh, I thank you for your passion. I thank you all for speaking honestly and openly. Because I think, you know, what Gabby, you said, you know, be careful what you put in this thing and don't cut out. Because, I, I, you know, as an editor, the last thing I want to do is take out the passion that someone is speaking from that's happened to them. Because, again, people say, I know how you feel. You don't know how I feel if you haven't experienced what I have experienced. So now we're going to have an opportunity through this question and answer to ask them additional questions, maybe some things that you guys may have some questions about. Uh, but anyway, let's give him another hand, guys. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge a few people that showed up. We have a board member of Boyden Street, Elva Prince, stand up. Thank you. We have Metricon, um, Kathy Highway, the CEO. And we have Connect 360 members. And if you could just wave your hand, Terrence over there, Mr. Perkins, Melissa, and Donald, Vivian Robinson, Nancy Maxwell, Mr. Wimberly, and myself. And with that, um, thank you, Colin. So, uh, first off, uh, do we have any questions you guys have? Yes, Mr. Perkins. You guys did go. I didn't go uh, to the Southern Counties Act, but you are correct. Eh? Washington, D.C.
I used to always wonder why there were really not any black people in high position jobs here in the area. And it's like, a black, I seen something when I first put an application, the application was to the war. They were never called for it. So they were never called for jobs and not talk to us. I myself was a example of it. So I decided, okay, well, I'm going to raise my own head about this because I'm qualified. I don't talk to jobs that I'm not qualified for. And I feel like I should have the skills like everybody else has when I apply for jobs. So now that I currently work in the Department of Human Resources, I'm going to start applying for jobs that I'm not Center for me is a major point. I think the neighborhood needs to come together like we used to here at the Boyd Street Center. We need to talk about our problems right here and then have a committee where we work together and then take that issue to the mayor, to the city council. But we first have to come together and agree with ourselves. One of the major problems that uh, seems to be going back to is trying to do it things individually. It won't work that way. You, know, you have to come together collectively and let dialogue so we can work with this thing together. And uh, when you come together as, as, as a community in the neighborhood that's been overlooked for generations and you talk about it, and here in this Boyd Street community, we know how to talk. We teach them how to talk. We teach you how to say certain things that get your point across, that you don't argue. You communicate. There's an old saying I heard years ago dogs fight, fools fall out, but wise men disagree. And so when you come here to Boyd Street Community Center, here you can learn to talk and have dialogue. And that's what I see is it, it's not that strong anymore. But I don't, I, I look at the parents for that. Parents got to realize this place right here, the foundation of this place right here, that. You see some genius death, but this is why this place is this. And when we come together, it was like you heard uh, Brother Jenkins and Brother Alto, we came together as a community. And we come together and we educated ourselves. And we, we got people to come in and talk to us and teach us how there's got to be a lot more dialogue amongst ourselves before we go uptown. But when we go uptown, we already know how to talk. There's a, a saying, be angry, but don't sin. See, so we got to learn to have a righteous anger and how to approach things and let them know we're displeased. So for me, the thing first we need to do is we need to have a list of the issues that we're concerned about as a black neighborhood as black people in the city of Marion. We really need to have a list of that because when you drive into Marion, if you drive into Marion, you think it's all one. When you go into different shops and banks, police station, fire station, you think it's all one. You think it's just a white city town. Because the words of black people are we are you, know, you saying none of us are educated enough to be in these jobs and positions? But we know from experience and actual facts, and even with the housing, how we learned they put pinholes in if it was a black person or certain dots. It's just, well, this come from white people teaching me. They put pinholes in so you're not going to get this job, you're not going to get this house. And so there are, there are tricks of the trade without saying what race you are, they can't hold it. And so when we got educated in this, the answer is you've got to get angry. People, people who are not angry are not going to do anything. You must be angry, but you've got to be intelligently angry. You're angry means you need to be aggressive. You see, but you got to be righteously aggressive. And so for me, that's the answer. What I see right now 
is today to leave that's missing again. And this place, Board Street Center, is the ideal place for people to come together. Because when we did come together, you'd be amazed how many whites, when they heard our voice, joined in with us once we were together. And they see we were one unit in agreement, then you should have seen all the whites that come forward. So that's what we need to do today. We need to get more involved with this neighborhood and uh, start dialoguing amongst ourselves. Just that, that was one of the reasons why we formed Connect 360. That is what our organization is about connecting people one together. Any other questions in the audience? Yeah, let's give them another hand, guys. I tell you what. What I heard is we have a building. Continue to build. Also heard individual efforts go nowhere. We have to come together. And so as we close this program, let's not close the door on coming together. I believe that with Connect 360, one of the things that we're working to do is work with Metrocon on the educational piece of that, uh, interview skills, things like that, trying to help you know qualify for jobs. Uh, I am pleased to be on the uh, Marion uh, board, Marion board. That uh, is a great position for me because uh, we talk about hiring uh, black police officers and black firemen. Minority police officer, minority fireman. I have a seat at the table. And my goal is to be fair for everyone. The process is going to be fair for everyone. Uh, already, through the collective effort of the merit board, already through the collective effort of the merit we have changed the test process. A standard test that someone has to take at an entry level to join the police force. That test has been changed to make it more fair, but also more applicable to someone who has not had police experience. So guys, things are being done. Maybe not at the pace we would like for them to be, but I will say this. I must stand up. I must be accountable. All of us stand up and be accountable. But let's be accountable for the correct and the right thing, not just what we want. There's a difference. There's a difference in the correct thing and what we may want. Okay? So, so as we close this again, if there's no other questions, yes. Yeah. Good point, sis. Yeah. Uh, Actually, uh, we have the application online uh, to uh, join Connect 360. If you're interested in becoming a part of Connect 360, uh, we are looking for new members. Yeah, this is the way you can take an active part. Yeah, our, our function is, is to be one, to be all inclusive, okay, but also to fight to connect everyone as a community, okay? And, and so that's what we're about, whether that be jobs, whether it be the opportunities uh, and, and activities, is to connect. And that's what we're wanting Yes, yes. Yes, yes, a great, great. 
We'll work on some literature. We do have a website, okay? And, and so we'll get the literature out as well, okay? Great, thank you. This, this is, uh, come on, Nancy. First off, this is Nancy. I don't know Nancy. If you live in Mary, you know Nancy. But she is really a far plug. And she's an activist. And but, but she's an activist for things that are right. Don't we? No, that's right. I ain't got it. County in the Right now, we are connected with Jackson County in the as a Williamson County committee. Once we reach 200 people who have successfully completed the membership process, we can start the NAACP right here in Williamson County in Maryland. So uh, please reach out to anyone that's on Connect 360 if you want some more information about joining the NAACP. $30 for the whole year, and it's well worth it. If you're going to continue this journey of making change in Marion, that will be one of the steps that we need to take. Also, on Monday, the 24th, we will be out here in Marion on the square doing peace circles because we're trying to bring peace in this building and not strife like this has been happening. So, um, keep that in mind as well. Miss Maxwell, is yes. the NAACP joining you? You have to be black. No, you do not. It's open to all races. I don't know. I know. Yeah. Right. Only uh, uh, unknown fact is uh, a black person did not start in the NAACP. A white person did. So yeah, it's open to everybody. Uh, yes, he is. Several professors and SIU are members. And state attorneys as well. Right. Yeah. We need to work on getting county people uh, involved in that department. Not near enough Williamson County people involved in the NAACP. Uh, and, and I think one of the reasons in the Black community. It's been said that the NAACP only works on big cases and not small. I don't know about the history of that. I just know today that we're about every case, about everybody, and especially in the local communities. So whatever that reputation was back then, it definitely don't hold now. That's why we got 360. And so it's about us all connecting together. We don't care what the, what the case is. It's the problem and issues that we're dealing with in the NAACP and the 360 as well. I'll say this. We were trying to get an uh, African American teacher in town. And I went, I'm a member of the NAACP, and I asked them, and they came to the school board at the time we were working on this, and they helped us with that. And we did get an uh, African American teacher in. They will come. Small issues, it's not just large issues. One other thing I'll say while I've got the floor. Also, mostly we're interested in what goes on here in Mary at, at the city government. But Williamson County, the county, hires people also. Sheriff, there's people in the police department and then the various offices. And then you, you, you don't see any, when you go in, you don't see any minorities there. Right? This is something that you said well, ago, well, one person can't get it. Because for the last three years, I've been going to the county board meetings, and one person is not going to get it. I, I mean, they'll let me get up and I'll talk and at the end of the meeting. But if I don't have other people with me, and we're not as a group, I'm just like, well, you know, we can walk out the door. So, as he was saying, it takes a group, it takes more than one person, or we're not going to get in. My point is, think about what goes on at the Williamson County Courthouse. I mean, we all pay taxes there. They have police. 
they go, they, you know, there they have, I think the last time I checked, they had about 227 employees that work for the county. And I think, I think it was somebody told me there's one Afro-American working there now. So we got work to do there, we do there also. I mean, they are highway department, there's people on the highway department, and, and there's just a lot of departments there. But we, most of us, you know, you guys here in Marion don't think about maybe the county. You think about what the city of Marion is doing, but there's, it goes even farther. Thank you. Do you have to be a member of the NAACP to be a member of the 360 group? No, you do not. You do not have to be. So we welcome you to become part of Connect 360. I think the next thing that I want to talk about is, first off, Nancy, the 24, we will put that out there so we'll tell you the time, but it will be a great opportunity to come together to take what we're doing here to show people the positive way. Just like this whole thing, when I watched this, I'm not from Mary, but I had a ball just sitting down with these people who educated me. Educated me on what was going on in this city, this town. And so my point is, I think the 24th is a great opportunity to come together and start to do things the correct way. Because I think a senseless murder, I don't think anything can top that one. But if we don't do something now, as you said, it's right around the corner. Okay. The other thing, one more thing, Tim, is, is uh, the next step for Connect 360 is, is Brother Don Island, Reverend Don Allen and Clarissa Allen, uh, it's, it's got their program that we're going to work on. Uh, that's, and I'll let you guys talk a little bit about that, uh, about coming together uh, and with uh, the law enforcement and, and things of that nature, because there's other things. So you wonder what we're about at 360. This is what we're about. These are things we're, we're about doing, not talking. Okay. Uh, that, it's going to be at four o'clock, Nancy. Yeah, four, to five. Four, four to five. Four o'clock to five o'clock on the 24th. <clears throat> on the square. Okay. Okay, and again, uh, I think it's a remembrance. Obviously, when you look at how things go on, just like 9 11, it was a big issue when it happened. And then it just becomes another day. Things that happen to us, we cannot let it be just another day. And I stare at you. 24. Okay, all right, I'm going to let you guys talk about. Before that, I just want to encourage all those new people coming in town. It would behoove you to try to get to know some of the local people because I've heard it said, and you've been here 20 years, I ain't from Marion. Well, once you're here over five or 10 years, you are from Marion. And we need to change that mindset so that we can all plan and um, win and work together. I'm going to let Clarissa start out by sharing about what we want to do with the police and uh, sheriff's department. Well, my main uh, purpose for wanting to join in with uh, 360, which I, I thought it was going to be a good thing. It's a good thing. So far, good things have, good things have been happening. Uh, but my purpose what was on my heart was to see a better relationship between um, police department, sheriff's department, and the citizens and residents of, uh, well, we'll just include Williamson County, along with Marion. My heart's in Marion, and been here a lot of years, so I've seen some things happen, and my husband and I have been counseling for umpteen years. So we've heard a lot of stories, police stories, people that have been abused and misused and the authority that the police have taken. And so th that's where my heart is. And that's one of the uh, phases that we'll be working on. We want to deal with the 
issue where folks may think it's a slogan, but for us who are black, it's for real. Being stopped because we're driving while black, it's got to stop. Just pulling us over at random. That happens all too often. In, 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 if it's a young man or a young uh, black man or a young black woman, then they really get issues really hard at them. It's the way you talk to them. And then when you pull them over, you don't really want nothing. That's happened repeatedly here at Marion. And so there's an attitude that's got to change here with the police department and the neighborhoods. Uh, it's like when you come into the police, coming to the black neighborhood, there's a different tone of voice. There's a different uh, dialogue with dis disrespect. And so this has got to change. And so uh, my wife and I, we want to sit down with the law officials and see if we can talk with them and make, make them aware of this kind of thing because it is offensive. Uh, we should be able to smile when we see the police in our neighborhood. Instead, we on guard. We don't want them to get arrested or shot or nothing. And you see this kind of thing, it, it's got to stop. We who are parents and grandparents, we're concerned about our kids being shot. Our kids being pulled over the door because we don't know what to expect from the official who are supposed to be protecting us. And the ones who are protecting them to us, the black neighbors, they're our predators instead of our protectors. And so we want to, we want them to see how we see them. And it's called the attitude they portray. But then we got an attitude we got to portray. And that's what I'm talking about here in the Boarding Street Center. There's an attitude we got to have towards the law officials too. Man. But remember, and I, I say this, and I don't mean to be fooling anybody, but anybody is a, that's a sheriff, deputy sheriff, anybody's a policeman, chief of police, whatever, you you volunteered for that job. You weren't drafted to that job. Nobody made you take that job. But when you took that job, the main thing in that job is you respect the people you're supposed to be protecting and don't disrespect them. Because if, if you get to a point where you can disrespect them, you need to quit that job. But if you're going to stay on that job, don't draw your gun. You see what I'm saying? Look, try to dialogue first. And so this is what I'm saying about when we, when we talk to law enforcement, uh, the, the last thing you want to do is draw a gun. Let's communicate. But they work in both ways in the neighborhood. And so this is kind of thing my wife and I will be talking to now. The police department and sheriff department about. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, brother Allen. So, with that being said, I'm gonna let uh, Harmon speak. Uh, go ahead, Terrence. Thank you, brother Allen. Yeah, okay. definitely don't want to uh, mess up Harmon's. I'm always getting trouble. Yeah. <laughs> but. I'm, I'm definitely moved and overwhelmed by the video and the things that you guys did and put yourselves out there to make Marion a better place, but also make a better place for a lot of other people. And indirectly, I guess I'm one of those people that say I ain't from Marion, <laughs> but I live in Marion. You know, my kids don't still here, but you know, I'm here, you know. Uh, but with that being said, you guys. The Allen family had a, a direct, indirect impact on my life coming over here to Marion, and I wanted to say thank you um, for that. Uh, what I mean by that is when I moved over this way, and I stepped out of the public, and I was well spoken, I was light, I was lauded for things. So they said, "Oh, you must be an Allen." <laughs> so I rolled with it. <laughs> And the same token, I'm like, I gotta find out who these animals are, <laughs> you know. So then, when I bought a house on the north side, when people come up to me, they'll say, "Oh, so are you an island?" I said, "No, I'm not. I just moved into Marin." Oh, are you over there on the like the gin side? Where's that at? You know? <laughs> and I said, "No, I'm I'm on the north side. I'm I'm over this way, you know." And I remember a, a guy coming up to me, my neighbor. And he said, so uh, are you here to clean the house? I said, no, sir. I, I, I'm right. <laughs> you know? And he said, you, you bought the house. And I'm talking on North Van Buren Street. You know? I said, no, I bought the house. He said, you bought it? How'd you do that? <laughs> and he said, are you related to the Allens? 
<laughs> By that time, I was I, I became good friends with Big Craig, and I appreciated that, you know, because I kept saying, "Well, yeah, it's my cousins," you know, because <laughs> I just started to hold some weight, you know. And so uh, again, um, I definitely uh, appreciate that, you know, because your stories and the things that you guys did over in this area definitely resonated with that. And so now, when minorities are moving into Marion, they are not just placed in one area. You know, by the real estate agents and everything else. You know, they have opportunities to live throughout, sporadically throughout. And so that's something else that you guys definitely worked hard to change, and I appreciate that. Okay, so we're going to close, but Ms. Carmen, if you want to talk about your portraits, it would be awesome, please. Uh, look, at, look at these portraits here. I'm going to show y'all. Okay, I mean, you know, she, she, she's militant. Uh, right, you are. You are. <laughs> you are. But with that militant, there's passion. And, and what I heard my sister say is, is she got so upset at things going on in our community that this is how she expressed herself. And so with that, Carmen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wimbo. He's done putting me on the spot. Um, I just want to let anyone know I hadn't drawn in or painted in 50, 40 years, so it, it, I had to be really passionate to get back to that paintbrush. But I am saying if anyone wishes, because we do do fundraisers for Connect 360, if you want to print or copy, um, reach out. And you can get this. And if you don't want this particular portrait, you may, if you follow me, you may just get individual. Some people like just George Floyd. Some people like just Colin Kaepernick in our own hometown, Cecil. So I'm just putting that out there. If you want a copy, uh, or print or canvas, please reach out and let us know. And thank you all for attending again. And uh, let me ask a question. Uh, I'm going to ask you for some kind of donation for those. No, I'm not asking for a donation at all. What I'm saying is if you want a copy of any, I do have prices depending on what you want. Canvas, or print. These are originals. They're not going to go away. <laughs> but one of these will. I will have a silent auction on one of these at some point in time for I'm donating it to 360. But I'm just saying, if you want a copy, let me know. I'll reach out. I'm retiring from painting. <laughs> Again, guys, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, this concludes the program. Uh, this will be available uh, on, on online as well. I know I'm going to put it on my Facebook page. Uh, so, you know, I think, again, this is something that's not a living, breathing thing that we're doing. This is not a meeting and then stop. So you'll be able to view it, share it with people, okay? And you know what? And if we can't come and have honest conversations black or white, we really had issues with that. I mean, seriously. Okay. So, hey, thank you again. God bless you guys. Have a